everybody. Happy Monday. So much went down over the weekend. Obviously, probably the biggest story is that Ron DeSantis has officially suspended his presidential campaign. Of course, we're going to talk about that. But first, my question, what the hell is Nikki Haley ever talking about? I, I honestly, I think this is the bigger story that no one's paying attention to. She's now saying that she is a brown girl. She was a brown girl. And I really need your guys' help. We really need to investigate Nikki Haley's claims from her childhood. Let's talk about that. Plus, a father is being hailed as a hero because he's on TikTok and he's only 20 years old and he's agreed to get a vasectomy. Yeah, he makes it look super trendy, guys. And he's doing it, he says, to prevent his super fertile wife from getting pregnant again. Let's talk about that trend. All that and more coming up on Candace Owens. This episode is brought to you by Preborn. Let's join together and help mothers choose life. Donate now at preborn.com slash Candace. I have to say, I perhaps underestimated Nikki Haley in Iowa. I mean, she did come in third place, but I was surprised that anybody turned out to vote for her. And it turns out that the reason that Nikki Haley got votes is because Democrats are crossing over and voting for her. And Nikki understands that. Of course, she understands that if she wants to secure even more Dem votes, she's going to have to lean into the race narrative. Listen to Nikki Haley doing exactly that as she sat down with an NBC reporter to talk about her childhood. Let's hear what she had to say. You were the only Indian family in our small southern town. I was teased every day for being brown. So anyone that wants to question it can go back and look at what I've said on how hard it was to grow up in the deep south as a brown girl. Yeah, she's a brown girl now, and she wants us to believe that she was teased every day in the non-segregated South. Again, she was born in 1972. She graduated high school in 1989. But every day, she claims that uh, she was teased because she had brown skin, which is stunning to me because, I mean, I, I obviously can't claim to know uh, what it was like to grow up in the Jim Crow era. Neither, by the way, can Nikki Haley because she didn't grow up during it. But not even my grandfather, who did, says that he was teased every day. But Nikki was because apparently um, she's Indian. And so people were just following her, I guess, and going, ah, brown girl, brownie, brownie, Pillsbury brownie, or something like that. Doesn't really past the sniff test, of course, we can't go back to evaluate that statement. We can't say for a fact that it's untrue, even though I'm confident it's a lie. But it doesn't stop just there. Uh, she then talks about her experiences as a brown girl not growing up in the segregated South, particularly as it pertains to her memory of participating in a beauty pageant. Take a listen. Saying that I had black friends is a source of pride. Saying that I had white friends is a source of pride. If you want to know what it was like growing up, I was disqualified from a beauty pageant because I wasn't white or black, because they didn't know where to put me. So look, I know the hardships, the pain that come with racism. Yeah, I have questions. Nikki Haley, just to restate, is saying that she was disqualified from a beauty pageant because they didn't know where to put her. And again, given that she was born in 1972, I would assume she began enrolling in beauty pageants around 1980, unless she was an infant. Um, that just doesn't pass the sniff test. So I decided to investigate that because somebody said that she mentioned this same story in a book that she had written in the past, that uh, despite the fact that, again, the South was desegregated, that they disqualified her from a beauty pageant. So I'm imagining that she walked in and said, I would like to participate in this. And they said, no, because you are neither white or black and we believe in segregation. But that's not the story that she tells. I was able to find it in her 2012 book entitled Can't Is Not an Option. She tells the story of her beauty pageant days. She says that her and her sister, by the way, were four and eight-year-old contestants in the We Miss Bamberg pageant in South Carolina. And here's what she says exactly. To this day, I'm not sure why my mom decided it was a good idea to enter Simi and me in the pageant. We weren't really a family that put a lot of stock in those kinds of things. 
But I remember that I wore a roughly white dress. My talent, such as it was, was singing. And my song was, This Land is Your Land. I remember my brother, Mitty, playing in the band below the stage as I sang my song. He watched me and started laughing when I forgot the words. After all the little girls had performed, they lined us all up on stage. The little white girls were on one side, the little black girls were on the other, and Simi and I were in the middle. The pageant traditionally had two winners, a black queen and a white queen. But before they revealed who the winners were, the organizers of the pageant said they had an announcement to make. They called Simi and me out of the line and said, we don't have a place for you. Then they thanked us and handed us gifts. I got a beach ball. I didn't understand. And I think that last sentence is really important, that she did not understand. Um, Because here's the thing. If the pageant has rules that you must be either black or white, they probably wouldn't have allowed you to perform This Land Is Your Land. They probably wouldn't have allowed you to compete. They would have disqualified you from the beginning. Nikki Haley has a habit of just not quite understanding things. I said this from the beginning. She's kind of surprising me in the way that Kamala Harris surprises me in that I was shocked by how actually stupid Kamala Harris was. Until she started talking, I realized that there's not much sense that's guiding her. And I have felt the same about Nikki Haley throughout this campaign, especially when she got on stage and said that ridiculous statistic about that if you spend an hour and a half on TikTok, you'll basically become Adolf Hitler. Nothing stopped her brain from saying that doesn't make sense. Similarly, as she's thinking about her childhood, nothing has stopped her all of these years from realizing, hey, wait a minute, If they had rules that said that you had to be either black or white to compete, why would they have allowed me to compete in the first place? What she's recalling in her head as they didn't allow us to have a place, I think she misunderstood. And what really happened was she just didn't place. I think they called out her and her sister from the line because they lost, which would explain why they gave her a participation trophy, which she describes as a beach ball. She goes on to write, the beach ball was a disqualification gift. What Simi understood, and every adult in that auditorium understood, but I didn't, was that my sister and I didn't fit into either of the categories, black and white, by which the pageant judged the winners. Again, Nikki Haley, that makes entirely no sense. Just your common sense should come on to say, that they would have just simply disqualified you from the beginning. Also, I'd like to point out again, she did not grow up in the time of Jim Crow. This particular incident that she's referring to had to take place in the 1980s. And I would also think it's relevant to point out that in 1984, the first mixed race Miss America was crowned and her name was Vanessa Williams. So I struggle to believe Vanessa Williams, who also was raised in the South, that Vanessa Williams was able to compete and become Miss America, but Nikki Haley, at the age of either four or eight, was at the same time, around the same time, being disqualified um, simply because she was brown. But this is the new Nikki Haley, and you're going to see more and more of this Nikki Haley because, as I said at the beginning, she understands that she now needs to appeal to Democrat voters. And I'm not talking about the moderate Dems, but I'm talking about far left who always want an ism, right? They want to believe that you're defying sexism, that you're defying misogyny, that you're defying racism, and that's the reason that they're going to elect you because America needs to see a woman. And now, which unbeknownst to most of us, Nikki Haley is leaning into the fact that she is Indian. And so she wants you to remember her as a brown woman who was disqualified in the post-Jim Crow era uh, from a beauty pageant. Yeah, Nikki, you are lying, but I don't think you intend to do. I, I, I actually believe that she is just this dense. All right, guys, now let's talk about the huge story. Obviously, DeSantis stepping down from his presidential campaign, announcing that it is officially over. Uh, by the way, I think that was absolutely the right call. And I want to say this right at the top. I tweeted this yesterday. This is not a time for people to be dunking on DeSantis supporters. I was never a DeSantis supporter. Um, you know, I, I called out last June that his campaign was dead on arrival. And the reason for that was simply because I still believe that DeSantis has a little bit of a personality problem. And I think that he was listening too much to his advisors. I think the campaign had way too much money and he wasn't trusting his gut instinct. 
For me personally, DeSantis would have been more likable if he stopped doing that fake smile and stopped saying things and pretending that, you know, he'd love to be around people. It just, it didn't register to me as the real DeSantis. I think he's quite grouchy and that's okay. Watching him fake smile and that whole bit would be like watching Matt Walsh try to act like Michael Knowles. For the most part, it just made me uncomfortable. You know, we know Matt is grouchier and Mike Knowles, my, my Michael Knowles is smiling all the time. It just it didn't feel right to me. But the worst thing, obviously, was his orbit of influencers. And I'm not saying this to say that there weren't Trump supporters who were saying awful stuff online. I'm saying this to say that Trump already had an established, dedicated, loyal base. DeSantis did not. He had to earn votes. And unfortunately, people on his campaign, mainly Christina Pushaw, who was an official campaign director, were really nasty online. And it cost him votes. It, it made it unbearable, to be honest. They also had a recognized orbit of influencers. She notoriously sat down with a ton of them for dinner. They were similarly as nasty. Again, not to discount the fact that nastiness was being thrown from both Trump supporters and DeSantis supporters, but... In this case, I think it did cost DeSantis a lot of uh, potential new votes because they were nasty towards Trump supporters. And essentially, Christina Pushaw could not ignore Laura Loomer. She was basically blaming all Trump supporters for everything that Laura Loomer said online. And it just, it, I, I think that she was way too emotional and she wasn't the right person for the job. That's my personal take. All that aside, I do want to say that there are tons of people that supported DeSantis who are not neocons. They are not people that were never Trump. Of course, there is a contingent of those individuals like Meghan McCain, her husband. They were never going to support Trump anyways. They will be voting for Nikki Haley. Call those individuals out. But we should not discount the individuals who got behind the Sanders because they actually thought that he would do a better job than Trump. The people who voted for Trump in 2016, voted for Trump in 2020, and then turned to DeSantis because maybe they just felt that Trump wasn't leading the country in the right direction. But those individuals, we need to appeal to now. We actually need to have a united Republican Party. And I want to say that DeSantis's speech that he gave was great. It was fantastic. And we should take a listen to what he had to say. It's clear to me that a majority of Republican primary voters want to give Donald Trump another chance. They watch his presidency get stymied by relentless resistance, and they see Democrats using lawfare this day to attack him. Well, I've had disagreements with Donald Trump, such as on the coronavirus pandemic and his elevation of Anthony Fauci. Trump is superior to the current incumbent, Joe Biden. That is clear. I signed a pledge to support the Republican nominee, and I will honor that pledge. He has my endorsement because we can't go back to the old Republican guard of yesteryear a repackage formed of warmed over corporatism that Nikki Haley represents. The days of putting Americans last, of kowtowing to large corporations, of caving to woke ideology are over. He was great. And I have said from the very beginning, I always liked Ron DeSantis as governor. I will never discount um, what he did. He was absolutely a leader during the times of COVID. You know, what he did for the state of Florida during COVID was something that took a lot of bravery to stand up to the administrative state, to stand up to the CDC, to stand up to Anthony Fauci. And I just want to stress that any person that is just dunking on every single DeSantis supporter and wrongly castigating them all as neocons, it's not going to be helpful in the end. Tons of people that I admire and respect supported DeSantis, and they are in no way people um, that didn't want Trump because they were never Trump. I would never describe Definitely not. Matt Walsh was someone who was vocal in his support for DeSantis. Ali Stuckey, you know, she particularly said that it was Trump's take and uh, on abortion that turned her off to Trump. You know, these are these are Christians saying, "Here's what I don't like about Trump." We need to listen to that feedback and figure out how Trump can invite them back uh, to his side. Now, in terms of Donald Trump and how he responded. He was also very kind and very gracious and, of course, very funny when reporters asked him about DeSantis dropping out of the race. Here's what he had to say. Okay. You just said, will I be using the name Ron DeSanctimonious? I said, that name is officially retired. <laughs> that name is officially retired, which is basically his way of saying, listen, we all sling some mud. 
That's what it means, obviously, when you are running against somebody is you are going to, in his case, give them a name. But he's moving on from it instantly. And he kept up that same spirit in New Hampshire and was magnanimous in crediting DeSantis for all of his hard work campaigning. Take a listen. Before we begin, I'd like to take time to congratulate Ron DeSantis and, of course, a really terrific person who had gotten to know his wife, Casey, for having run a great campaign for president. He did. He ran a, a really good campaign, I will tell you. It's not easy. They think it's easy doing this stuff, right? It's not easy. I would like to echo that sentiment and also congratulate Ron DeSantis and his family. People really do think it's easy to be in the public, to be bashed every second of every day. He's doing that, obviously, while running the state of Florida. It's not. Um, you know, his family obviously was extremely gracious with their time throughout this entire campaign. And it, I would imagine, was very hard on the children, was very hard on his wife. And they did a great job. I think it's it's just necessary for everybody to acknowledge that none of it is easy. And yeah, I am very much hopeful that the two of them will unite, put all of the petty grievances aside. And that's what I hope for every single person that claims to care about this country. Put your petty grievances aside, and every person now needs to stand behind the presumptive nominee, which is Donald J. Trump. And definitively, what we should be united against is Nikki Haley, because that woman, if ever there was a neocon shill, it is her. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Did you know that 65 million babies' lives have been tragically ended through abortion? Sadly, since the overturning of Roe, their lives are at an even greater risk. It's been reported that the abortion pill now accounts for over 50% of all abortions, making abortion available 24-7. Preborn needs our help. For just $28, the cost of a dinner, you can sponsor an ultrasound to introduce a mother to her baby for the first time. I was just kind of like, Lord, if this is, you know, if this is the way, you know, let me know. If this is not the way, give me a sign, you know, before I walk through these doors. And I was, as I was getting ready to walk up the steps and touch the doorknob, you know, a guardian angel. And he just told me, he was like, baby, you don't have to go in there. And he was like, I know someone that can help him. Just to see the development of a baby that small, and I say baby because, I mean, he had little arms and legs, and <laughs> I mean, you know, it was actually a, a human, you know, and to see that and to have that physical and that contact once you look at that, I think it just pulls on your heart a little. 100% of your donation will go toward saving babies. To donate, dial pound 250 and say the keyword, baby. That's pound 250, baby. Or you can donate securely at preborn.com slash Candice. That's preborn.com slash Candice. Okay, now it's time for some topics du jour. So by now we all know who George Soros is and the many projects that he funds, which appear to all of us to be anti-democratic. There's no question about that. But what do you know about the heir to his fortune? Alexander Soros. In 2023, the Wall Street Journal reported that he would be the heir to the Soros fortune and would immediately take over the Soros, Soros Open Society Foundation. Well, let me tell you a little bit about him. He is 38 years old. He's an American philanthropist. He's just one of the sons of George Soros. He is now the chair of Open Society Foundations, and he's also one of the World Economic Forum's Young Global Leaders of 2018 and beyond. Now, I want to make it clear, Alexander Soros is a trust fund baby, but just because you come from a lot of wealth doesn't necessarily mean that you're stupid or that you didn't earn some of your success. Rare opportunity. I had never tried to find clips of Alexander Soros speaking, but we had a rare opportunity to hear him speak. Um, at the World Economic Forum this year in Davos. He was on a panel, and I'm not kidding when I say I was shocked to hear him speak, actually shocked to hear Alexander Soros speak because I had never imagined that, <laughs> I guess, what would come out of his mouth or what didn't come out of his mouth would be what I would hear. So I'm going to challenge you guys. First, I'm going to apologize. I'm going to challenge you to put on your best SAT test thinking cap I want you to, for the next two minutes, just really hone in on his words. I want you to do your best to understand what the hell Alexander Soros, who has inherited billions, 
is trying to get across. Really, guys, I apologize in advance. Take a listen. I don't think that that's the fundamental. I don't think the technology is the fundamental issue uh, in, in democracy. Democracy is messy. I mean, you know, democracy is about contestation of ideas. It's about uh, plurality. Um, it's about people having different truths, actually. Now, um, fundamentally, uh, how society lives together um, civically um, in, those, in those contestations um, is, you know, is obviously, uh, is obviously um, you know, quite, uh, quite, uh, you know, quite tricky. But I think that if we play too much on this disinformation card, we're taking the responsibility away from ourselves to actually create a narrative that inspires people to vote and to believe uh, you know, in, um, uh, in, uh, in democracy and democratic um, institutions. And on the institutional part, I think that we can talk about uh, institutions as these abstract things, but institutions are also about people. Mm-hmm. And, um, you, know, um, you know, we just heard this, this, this point about untrustworthy people, and we talked about things in the United States like, you know, like um, checks and balances, which aren't written anywhere, but are customs. And one man... Donald Trump literally came in and just took that, you know, took that, took that all away, um, you know. So, um, you know, so, um, you know. But when I see this, you know, when I look at this, um, you know, um, you know, uh, more globally regarding, regarding, you know, regarding democracy, I also say to myself, when was this great time that everybody got along so well, and you know, things were going so, so great? I mean, I think, you know. Um, um, you know the, um, you know I think that we really have to be careful here, in you know in this nostalgia, uh, for a time uh, you know for a time past because a lot of the reactions we're seeing in society are actually reactions to positive uh, to positive things like you know like equality uh, for women um, you know uh, and um, uh, you know and greater diversity uh, which come with backlash. Literally, what just happened? I'm, I'm asking you seriously. This, these are the individuals who get up on stage because they believe that they are the brightest people in the world and that you are too stupid to know how to live your own lives. And so they have to plot and they have to sit down and they have to think about the future of the world because you're just not smart enough to know how to take care of yourself. That is Alexander Soros the person that just inherited billions of dollars. He is going to represent the future. And he quite literally cannot string together a sentence. He can't. Nothing, no piece of that made any sense. I've listened to it multiple times. I'm sorry I made you have to listen to it. It makes no sense. It's so incoherent. It's actually amazing. If mumbo jumbo was a person, it would be Alexander Soros. I actually tried to think of how he could possibly say so much and absolutely nothing within a two-minute span. And I thought maybe he's on drugs. Maybe he had a long night out. But no, somebody that's hungover can in two minutes get out one sentence. That makes sense. Maybe he's high on cocaine. Nope, that person would definitely be able to get out a few sentences. Yeah. Did he take a pill? No, I think even a person that is under the influence of opioids would be able to get out one coherent sentence, and Alex Soros did not. Because as I said, Alex Soros is a trust fund baby, and he's not a bright one. And despite all of that, the clip would be actually hilarious if it wasn't for the fact that, as I said, he has inherited billions, and he is going to shape the future of this country. He has the ability to do that because of the wealth that, obviously, his father earned, because I'm going to say that he's simply not capable of earning that sort of wealth on his own. Now, moving on and talking about the future of this country, I was very struck, I always am struck, when these TikTok trends take off. I'm really struck by what people are willing to do for attention, the stories that they want to tell. And yes, this father is being hailed as a hero because he's 20 years old and he's showing everybody and talking about how he got a vasectomy. You guys, take a listen. I got a vasectomy at 20 years old. Hi, I'm Tristan, I'm 21, and I got a vasectomy. This decision is ridiculous, but I have my reasonings and I stand by them completely. And here they are. Coming in at number one, I already have a kid. Kind of ridiculous to already have one kid at 21. Arguably irresponsible. Reason number two, kind of weird, kind of 
My wife is really firm. It's just like genetic. Her sister has four babies. They're awesome. I love them so much, but they were all accidents. I'm also just trying to think about the future financially. I live in my parents' basement right now. I don't think it's a very good decision to have two kids while you live in your parents' basement. So with all that in mind, I got a vasectomy. I think it's reversible, but also I've seen online that it's not. So much happening there, guys. Just so much happening. First and foremost, just admitting that he doesn't even know if it's reversible. He's like, I don't know I'm, I, if I'm ever going to be able to have children again. I didn't even think to ask the doctor the question. But hey, I'm holding a microphone. It's on TikTok, and I look pretty cool, and I've got millions of views. So isn't that enough? Why ask the doctor any questions? Also, when he remarks that the reason he did this, one of the many brilliant reasons that he did it is because his wife is, like, super fertile, and it's, like, genetic. At nobody, you guys are 20 years old. Your wife is in her prime. All women are supposed to be super fertile when they are that young. There's nothing genetically wrong or unique about your wife. That's just called basic biology. And apparently you missed that class. I'll tell you what's really alarming about this. Um, first and foremost is the fact that he's being hailed as a hero, that we are seeing more and more um, that people that do not have their brains developed, because at the age of 20, your brain is not fully developed, are basically making an argument for sterilization one way or the other. I think sterilization is now becoming a trend. Last year, we showed you a video of a woman who put her fallopian tubes in a necklace for TikTok and was like, now I never have to worry about having a baby. This is more or less that exact same trend. And the fact that the media is rushing to encourage it, something about it feels quite sinister. Again, he has no idea what he's doing. He has no idea what it means long term for him. This is about getting attention. Now, saying that he wasn't prepared to have children, great. That's a great conversation to have. Could he be a voice for talking about, you know, how difficult it might have been for him, how difficult it is for him because he lives in his parents' basement? Absolutely. But trying to pretend that the average 20 year old should be pursuing a vasectomy as an act of heroism, absolutely flawed positively flawed. And again, something that I believe is intentionally being promoted in this society, which is why I wanted to point it out. These kids know nothing and get attention for doing things that are absolutely senseless. Look no further, by the way, when we talk about these future generations, than this young woman also on TikTok, just grappling, I think, with some life questions, really. Just wondering about the world. Why is there so much drama in America and not in other places. Take a listen to this TikTok user. Most irrelevant country right now is India. First of all, have they ever fought in a war? I feel like they don't participate in war, which is fine, I respect that, that's like unproblematic, but like what's good with them? Do they have a king or a president? Also, does no one want their land? Why? I respect that they stay out of conflict, but like who do they fight for? Who are their allies? I just feel like I never hear about them. Like, no natural disasters, no uprisings. They're never in the press. Where are you, India? Generation TikTok. Now, I want to be clear that she has since taken down this video, I think namely because people in the comments were asking her whether or not she was clinically retarded. And she was quite embarrassed about the content that she produced. But I don't think she should be embarrassed. And I don't think that she's someone that should be made fun of either. Because there's a more important discussion that we should be having about this generation that's coming out, the generation, uh, these are going to be our future leaders, our future congressmen, our future teachers, um, our future police officers. What do they actually know? India actually overtook China as the most populous country. Turns out they have had tons of wars. She doesn't know any of that because she is a victim of the Department of Education Something that I routinely talk about on this show, why I am encouraging mothers to homeschool their children if they can, because she now represents the average student, right? She's going to go to some university. She's going to get some fluffy degree. And then she's going to come out and realize that she knows very little, least of all, how to take care of herself or how to actually earn an income outside of trying to sell herself on the internet. That's what's happening. We are mass producing people that know nothing and yet will be the first person to preach to you about some moral crusade that we need to get behind, right? This is generation, I don't know what it means, but I'm going to put a flag in my bio, and I'm going to talk about pronouns because these topics make me feel good because I think that I'm doing something important when, in fact, I'm not doing anything important. That's what's happening here. So again, you can laugh at her 
or you can realize the severity of our circumstances when a young woman who has no idea what's happening, probably even outside of her own bedroom and outside of her own home, is able to garner hundreds and thousands of followers on TikTok, which, by the way, she has. And when a young man who's trying to make vasectomy trend gets millions of views and is being applauded as a hero. Ladies and gentlemen, we have some big issues that we need to tackle in America. But I'm confident that we can do it. I'm confident that more and more people are at least waking up to the predicament that we are in, a circumstance in which there is an incentive to make us stupid, to make the entire population think or not think in the way that these young people do. All right, guys, now it's time to jump into some of your comments regarding episodes past. The Candace Owens Podcast is supported by Grand Canyon University, an affordable private Christian university with a vibrant campus in beautiful Phoenix, Arizona. Ranked top 50 in the country by Niche.com, GCU is a missional, Christ-centered university that strives to foster a culture of community, giving, and impact. GCU's goal is to help you develop into a servant leader who makes a difference through finding your purpose. With 330 academic programs and over 270 online as of June 2023, GCU integrates the free market system with a welcoming Christian worldview into your bachelor's, master's, or doctoral degree. You'll have support from your own university counselor who takes a personalized approach to helping you achieve your goals. So find your purpose at Grand Canyon University. Visit gcu.edu today. Private. Christian, affordable. On Friday, I made a call to action. I said, make a comedy racist again because everybody is way too sensitive and things were funnier and people were more lighthearted when I was growing up in the 90s. Now everyone takes themselves way too seriously. Kelly writes, facts, Candace, facts. Born in 1973 and we had ranking competitions, which were so much fun. Even the Yo Mama jokes, nothing was off limits. We had a melting pot of people. OG Bride of Chucky writes, I am not a conservative, nor am I completely liberal. I actually lean towards the middle, but I grew up in the 70s and 80s when comedy was true comedy, when we had Richard Pryor, Eddie Murphy, George Carlin, and they were equally trashing all races, all religions, using non-PC rhetoric. I miss those days. I hope they can come back in my lifetime because I miss laughing at everyone. Yes, I totally agree. It brings people together when you say, you know what? You all kind of suck. That was kind of the purpose of a comedian, to put everybody in a room and to say, we are all really not that fantastic. We are all actually pretty annoying. Learn to laugh at yourself. Learn to laugh at others. It made us way more likable as a society. Ladies and gentlemen, unfortunately, that is all the time that we have for today. We will see you tomorrow for a brand new episode.